Good evening, everybody. My name is Alex Thier, uh, and I am the, oh, almost, sorry, everybody. Just getting started. <laughs> Uh, good evening, my name is Alex Thier, and I am the executive director here at ODI, and it is a great pleasure to invite all of you here this evening. I'm actually going to let uh, Christina Bennett, who is our magnificent head of HBG, do the formal uh, introduction and kickoff for this exciting event. Uh, but this is a personally special evening for me tonight, so I just wanted to say a word of welcome uh, to my friend and colleague, Gail Smith. Uh, Gail, it's a great pleasure to welcome you here to ODI and to have you deliver the annual HPG lecture. Uh, I had the honor of serving with Gail in the Obama administration, and I got to see her in action in good times and bad. Uh, <laughs> Only the best problems reach the situation room of the White House. And there are, as you can imagine, uh, even better than the West Wing, there are a lot of interests and perspectives that compete for attention and some very forceful personalities. Uh, and what Gail always was in those meetings was brave. Um, I don't know that the big wigs in those rooms always made the right decisions, uh, but I can tell you that in any meeting that I was in, they did not leave uh, without knowing what Gail thought. <laughs> um, and I think most importantly, those thoughts uh, were always with those who were struggling with conflict, with disease, with extreme poverty. Uh, she was their voice. Um, and fortunately for all of us in a different role, continues to be. Um, I think that Gail, through her work, always demanded the best of all of us in what we were trying to do, including of uh, the president, um, and I'm sure she's going to do the same of all of us tonight. So welcome again, Gail. Thank you, Alex. Welcome, Gail, and welcome, everybody, to the uh, sixth annual HPG annual lecture. Um, I'm pleased to see everybody here in London. I think we have about 100 people in this room. We also have more than 100 people online joining us tonight. Um, and before we get started, just to cover a few housekeeping issues, um, we will have a lecture from Gail, uh, so a bit of a debate then with her, and then I'll turn it over to questions both from here in London and also from online. Um, speakers who are asking questions should speak directly into the microphone so that we are able to, so that our online audience is able to hear all of you, um, and it can be picked up by our, our video conference. Please silence your phones, but feel free to tweet during this whole lecture. Uh, the hashtag is HPG Lecture. So let's get started. Um, welcome to the annual lecture on aid and multilateralism in an era of populist politics. As Alex was saying, I think we all understand, we live in very, very uncertain times. And last year at this meeting, we were trying to make sense of some of that uncertainty. We had just had the Brexit vote, Trump had just been elected president of the United States, and the anti-globalization sentiment and the aid skepticism that propelled them and propelled their support was high. This year, I think the only thing I can say about it, the, anything I can say that's different, is that we're more certain of that uncertainty. I think we know a little bit more now about what it looks like and how it kind of plays out in our work. We've seen support for key global processes eroded. The US withdrawal from the Paris Agreement, uh, and this week the Global Compact for Migration. Shrinking budgets for aid programs and definitions of overseas development assistance challenged. Not to mention the overt flouting of international humanitarian law by belligerents, by their proxies, and by the governments that support them. In the name of national interests, but at the expense of civilians and civilian lives and the values that the humanitarian endeavor always seeks to, to espouse. So at a time when interests outweigh those values and our tradi traditional supporters are disengaged from the solutions and we see sharp declines in public support for aid, where can we find support for preventing and ending conflicts and promoting humanitarian assistance? So to answer those questions and to deliver the annual lecture tonight, I <laughs> present to you <laughs> Gail Smith. Um, a bit about Gail, I think Alex has already told you a bit about Gail and, and her, um, 
and her personality, but I'm going to talk a little bit about what she's done. Gail is currently the president and CEO of the One Campaign. Um, previously, she served as a top advisor to two American presidents, most recently as the administrator for the U.S. Agency for International Development under the Obama administration. Gail has previously served as the Senior Director for Development and Democracy and the Senior Director, Director for African Affairs on the U.S. National Security Council. Outside of government, Gail founded the Sustainable Security Program at the Center for American Progress and co-founded the Enough Project and the Modernizing Foreign Assistance Network. Gail's humanitarian credentials include working for cross-border relief efforts in Tigray and Eritrea in the 1980s, providing aid to civilians in those places in the midst of war and under embargo. She's also worked as a journalist and for NGOs in Africa for more than 20 years. So let me, please join me in welcoming Gail Smith as the annual lecturer. Thank you. No pressure. Yeah, no pressure. Um, thank you. And uh, Alex, thank you. I, I didn't actually know that's what you thought at the time. Uh, um, hello, everybody, and, and I'm really honored to be here. I remember <coughs> uh, in, in the last century, um, truly was in the last century, when I first learned about this institution and how important it was and how exciting it was to me to discover that there was a place that just thought and worked on the issues that I then had just discovered. So it's really wonderful for me to be here. And as you just heard, I was asked to come and talk about aid and multilateralism in an area, in an era of populism. So my lecture is very brief. Multilateralism is on the wane. Populism is on the rise. And it's really bad for humanitarianism. Thank you very much. No, um, and I think, but I think we all know that, but I'm not sure that we've really taken that on board because I think we're at a moment where there is, for a period of time right now, no business as usual. Uh, <clears throat> I think, you know, we have this phrase we often used in government of admiring the problem. And this is a problem that we could admire for a long time. And I think the question, again, no pressure, is what do we do about it? Where I would start is by saying that I think we all need to acknowledge something that you know, but which is that humanitarian operations around the world today are breathtakingly impressive. I remember what we thought was complicated in the early 1980s, and that would be a walk in the park, I think, today. But I also think, as I said at the top, this is the most difficult moment this community has ever faced. And we've heard some of it. The United States is withdrawing at rapid speed. And when a superpower goes silent, it can be very deafening. One of the things I hear from a lot of people is, Less, although I do hear criticism of policies, don't get me wrong, but more that the U.S. just vanished. The U.S. isn't in this discussion anymore. This country, and I was able to do some press today, and one of the things I said, this country has had a huge role in this space. I remember when the U.K. created DFID. The U.K. got out there and elevated development. The U.K. did all this analysis with qualitative and quantitative metrics. The UK went to 0.7. The UK laid down the marker for the rest of the international community, and it is one other country's followed. And what are we looking at now? 0.7 is under fire. You are having, I think, across this country to defend aid in ways that are reminiscent to me of the 90s in the United States. And I think, tragically, too many people in this country don't know that what we're putting at risk here is UK leadership in this field, number one, and massive impact. So that's a huge, huge setback. I think we all know that countries across the north are turning inward, that the G8 now, the G7, it's, it's like it's going to go back to the G6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Like it's on some global anesthesia or something. It's, so I think, you know, look, in the United States, for example, one of the things we're doing is the one campaign is we launched a big report on World AIDS Day under the banner of Red Ribbon, White Surrender. An effort to end a global epidemic that no one would even talk about that took some real boldness from a Republican president, George Bush. 
and then a massive increase in reshaping of that initiative by Barack Obama, which made it something that America does in terms of leading the AIDS fight. We're looking at cutting funding. It is proposed by the current administration to cut funding in such a way that in an epidemic where we were catching up and on the verge of beating the speed of the virus, we could let it win. That's the kind of thing that we're looking about. It's all true that there have been great gains in defeating poverty, in <clears throat> global health, love technology. It really offers a huge number of solutions. People are talking about development finance, things we tried to get people to, do you know what a DFI is? Could you consider a DFI? Innovation is so thick across the development community that it's no longer innovative. All of those things are important in their gains, and the field has matured. But when you look at that against a backdrop of global passivity in the face of the obscenity of the crisis in Yemen, the seeming perpetuity of suffering for generations in South Sudan, the new competitor for the worst humanitarian crisis of 2018, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, or the mass bleeding out of serious suicide, all of that pales in comparison. So I think, are you depressed yet? Oh, no, we're going to get to the point. Don't worry. We're going to get to the point when we're like, OK, so what? What are we going to do? Um, but I think our challenge, I think we got to think about our challenge as more than just increasing aid budgets. Because I think what's at stake here is not just the funding, but the premise behind it. I think the world is rethinking whether or not it's in our collective interest to embrace, protect, defend, and invest in our common humanity. <coughs> Deep, right? So look at the numbers. According to OCHA, 145 million people are in need of humanitarian assistance today. And I will say, and I want to say this again because I think it's not said often enough, that despite its critics, I think the humanitarian system is robust and remarkably capable. I know I had the honor and privilege to work alongside OFDA at USDA, at USDA, at USAID, uh, and the DART teams these famous groups of kick-ass people that would go out in the middle of a crisis and just take over. The community today is more agile than it's ever been. Figuring out how to reach people in more difficult places is more effective in its use of technology and more capable of working across sectors. If you look at the Ebola response of 2014, granted, the world responded late, but this is something where I had two meetings a day for 14 months. Holidays, Saturdays, Sundays, on the response to the, the Ebola epidemic. I'm pretty sure it was the international humanitarian system that took that on. That community, including local health workers in Liberia and Sierra Leone and Guinea, thousands of healthcare workers from around the world, MSF creating the model for an Ebola treatment union, unit that was then copied by others, the deployment of hundreds of doctors and emergency aid teams, a whopping 437 million pounds from the UK and 2.6 billion dollars from the US. That was the international humanitarian community. Now, <clears throat> in the last couple of years, we've seen a lot of focus on this community and a lot of recommendations have been forthcoming and I'm used to hearing a lot of them as people who are not in this community look at the Yemens and the Syrias. And they keep saying with the humanitarian community it needs to do more, it needs to coordinate, it needs to get rid of bureaucracy. Frankly, to anybody who thinks the problem in this space is that the humanitarian community needs to coordinate better, my favorite is that it really needs to grasp the relief to development continuum. Because <laughs> I think that's the big problem. I don't think anybody on the emergency side knows anything about development. Nobody on the development side has ever thought about the other side. Really? When I hear that, it's like, this is really all you can come up with? And I think what we're seeing is that rather than tackle the problems that the international humanitarian community is cleaning up, the onus is being put on this community to do more and better to make them stop. And if you consider the facts that the number of people in need today is five times that of 10 years ago, Humanitarian appeals are four times larger, but funded at barely 50%. And the UN estimates that we'll need 22.5 billion 
for 2018, and that's excluding any unplanned emergencies. 97% of humanitarian assistance goes to complex emergencies, and 12 of the 13 most severe today are in countries experiencing conflict. As you noted, humanitarian action norms and laws are being constrained and eroded, I think, at record pace. We've had 111 people, humanitarian workers, killed in 2016, 97 so far this year, although I understand this morning that number may have increased. Now, I, I believe that the community can and should improve. We should all always do that, any of us in any of our lives and any of our work. And I went to the World Humanitarian Summit supportive of it. I'm for the grand bargain. I'm glad some of the, the agreements made there have been implemented. And basically what happened there, the entire world gathered in a humanitarian summit, agreed that the world was on fire, and decided that we really needed better fire trucks. That's what happened. The world did not go to the World Humanitarian Summit and say, why in the world, how in the world do we have this scale of catastrophe with this level of danger and this level of cost, and what do we need to invest into it and stop it? So I support the grand bargain. But again, if our solution to these crises is that humanitarian workers should take six weeks of development training and that there should be better coordination between WFP and the NGO community, I, I'm for all of that, but I don't think we're ever going to get anywhere. And I'll be honest, it, it makes me really angry. And now that I'm out of government, I can be angry more frankly than I didn't. Well, maybe I was angry sometimes, visibly in government. But I, you know, I'm looking at somebody here today who I know back from the time when I was in the middle of the Ethiopian famine. And I was on the other side of the lines. Uh, in a famine where more than a million people died, some because the world got to them too late, and most because the world basically didn't want to say out loud that there was a war in the middle of it. And coming out of that, I made a <clears throat> proposal at an NGO conference. Uh, this was probably 30 years ago. This was 30 years ago. It's really horrifying to say something happened 30 years ago and realize you were an adult at the time. I just. <laughs> If it hasn't happened to you yet, it will. It's weird. But I made the case that if NGOs were going to respond to humanitarian crises and wars, that they needed to study war. And they needed to under military, understand military strategy. And literally, people turned gray. And one person almost came across the table to silence me for fear that I was saying that the humanitarian community should invite politics into the room. That's not my point, but politics are already in the room. My point was that we can be neutral in intent, but our impact is not going to be neutral if we pretend that there's no politics. And we've got to figure out how to grapple with the politics. And so I think that's what we need to do now. And so when I got this very nice note from Alex, inviting me to do this lecture, I said to myself, all right, you could do a really depressing talk about how dire the whole world is. I've done that part. Uh, or what do we do? What does the international community do? So here's what I think we need to do. The first thing is this community needs to learn to brag. Um, it's all well and good that the world and summits have called for greater efficiency. I don't think it took a global summit for the hum international humanitarian community to figure out that micronutrients when deployed in the middle of an emergency can not only save a child's life, but enable that child to grow better and be stronger even after the crisis subsides. It didn't take the international community to tell humanitarians how to get across the lines in Syria. It didn't take the international community to have a summit to say, have you ever thought about using smartphones to track emergency assistance in a crisis? The fact is the humanitarian community is so agile and so creative, imperfect like all of us could improve, but so extraordinary, but doesn't brag. 
and I think this community needs to get out there and say, sure, we can always improve, uh, but here's who we are and here's what we do. I think the second thing is to unite. Um, this is hard. We've all worked in fields in advocacy where sometimes we're competing for the same resources. We've got different boards. We've got different obligations. This is a big community, and I, I see how powerful it is and how powerful it was in government when a collection of three or four NGOs or two or three heads of UN agencies would issue a statement with some ferocity. It, it got through. But if the entire community were to come together behind some of the issues we face today, it would make a huge difference. And right now, the community is fragmented, not out of, I think, of collective disregard, but I think out of a failure to come together with a single voice to say this is not acceptable. And we need a much louder voice. Third, I think this community needs to start making some asks of policymakers in the world that are more indifferent than just do the right thing. And I say that as somebody, I, I've been delighted to join one. I was the object of one's asks and aspirations uh, and learned a lot about what works and what doesn't. And I think there need to be asks. So let me frame a couple of them. Here's some more numbers. The Institute for Economics and Peace judges that violence costs the world 12.6% of GDP. That's $14.3 trillion, or almost $2,000 per person for every person in the world. That's the cost of war. <coughs> Excuse me. According to the same research, the average economic impact of violence for the 10 least peaceful countries was equivalent to 37% of their GDP. Now, it doesn't take a mathematician or an economist to figure out that the world's failure to invest sufficiently in preventing these or in staunching the bleeding when a crisis arises is expensive. And it's not new. I was on a commission on weak and fragile states in 2004. It's now like the flavor of the month in the states. I don't know about here, but fragile states are really big. Uh, and the conclusions, I mean, not rocket science. We need to invest in preventing states from sliding towards failure. We need to develop new innovative tools to stop failures. We need to reform institutions to better approach development and forge an international consensus to help fragile and failing states. I think we did really well. Uh, and I, we also concluded, and the facts show, that a fragile state wasn't going to turn into Norway in the span of an election cycle that it was going to take multiple years to do that. Now, I think what we need to do with all of that is we need to take a message to political leaders that just as we are challenged to account for our spending, any of you who has donors, who has ever had a donor, has to account for your spending. Anybody who's had to serve in government knows I had 535 people, you did, up on Capitol Hill that wanted to know about our spending. But we need to challenge them and ask them how, in the eyes of taxpayers and voters, they can justify underinvesting in development and humanitarian aid now when we know and the facts show that doing so will require overspending in the future. What's their answer? I've served in government twice. Nobody ever asked that question. No advocate, no group ever put that information out there. And I think it would get through because the facts are on our side. Then you get to humanitarian norms, and what do we do about that? I'm, I'm terrified by the erosion we're seeing and the, and the speed with which we're seeing the erosion for two reasons. One is the erosion itself, the violations, the steady, steady violations. But the other is the deafening silence in the face of the violations. I mean, we all talk to each other in the face of those violations and forward our press re releases around. But the international community is not responding. And again, I, I get that anger is one way to respond to that. But I think, again, there's something else we could do. Now, I, things like humanitarian norms and humanitarian space probably mean something to everybody here. We just had a big uh, holiday in the US Thanksgiving where everybody's family gets together. If you had said humanitarian space at the table I was at, people would be like, what? 
What is humanitarian space? We don't talk in a language that most people can understand. But take a page from what a lot of other groups do and have done on this. And that is to count and measure the violations in the same way that we count and measure every other things, aggregate them, and put them out once a year. New Year's Day every year, the international humanitarian community should issue its annual report. How many clinics were bombed this year? How many convoys were hit? How many humanitarian workers were killed? How many humanitarian norms and laws were broken? Put it out every year on New Year's Day. People will take notice. People will start to look for it. Tell the story again and again. Again, what I worry about now is that what happens, and look, we're dealing with this in the US. I'm dealing this with the, in the US where people don't want to hear about far off crises. Two things work. You tell the story again and again about a real human being, or you add up the numbers and you do the steady drumbeat of this is the state of the world. We've never done it. We tell individual stories. So what I'm getting at is something that um, I think the development community has taken on much more, but I don't think the humanitarian community really has, which is that I think what we need is an activist humanitarian movement. Um, by activist, I mean getting near that line of politics, uh, not partisanship. So how would we do that? Now, I've learned a lot from being inside one and seeing how effective it is and many of the other NGOs I've worked with over the years. But also, as I say, being on the receiving end, it's been fascinating to me. And if anybody wants to know more about this, I can share that to see what has worked and what doesn't when you're inside government. You've got people advocating that you make a change. But here are the four rules or the, the credo I would ascribe to an activist humanitarian movement. Be angry, but smart, and fierce, but fair. Uh, what I mean by that, and it's really difficult, I think we do better when we question somebody's policy or their vote than when we question their motives. Um, I am really angry about Yemen. I have really strong views about the motives of the actors involved. It's probably not going to be my most effective uh, approach. So how do you question the policy or the vote? The second is to invest in and reward political courage. And this is a tricky one. And I, I hope that it might be something that would work here as well as it's worked in the United States, not just on the humanitarian side, but also on the development side. We have had the benefit for the last 10 years of having bipartisan support for development and for humanitarian assistance. And I think the reason has been, and one of the, the things that the organization that I now run has done so effectively, is regardless of political party or affiliation, if you have the political courage to invest in humanitarian spending or development, we'll give you credit. And it really matters. It really matters a lot to people who are being elected. It also means you're calling out the people who are less, less visible. And I think, again, it's not always easy. But I will tell you that some of the most satisfying work that I ever did was bipartisan. Because um, it actually felt good in the middle of the ugliest, most partisan period of time I've certainly ever seen in my lifetime, to say there's one thing we could agree on. Ebola is bad. We should fight AIDS. Poverty is really bad for everybody. So I think that's, that's another one. The, the third one is keeping score. And again, I'm, I'm really quite serious about this. And I don't think uh, as much respect as I have for the humanitarian, international humanitarian community, I don't think we do that as well as the development side of the house or others track what donors are delivering assistance, what appeals are funded and are not funded, what governments have signed on to humanitarian norms and law, what governments are voting which way in the Security Council on resolutions that address these things, and make it public. 
Otherwise, the violation of these norms is happening step by step in deafening silence. It's happening bit by bit. There are a handful of people who read every story, but in the main, it's not, it's not being seen or heard. And my fear is that it's going to get so bad and go so far by the time everybody wakes up, so keep store. The last thing I think we need to bring into it is something I, I have a friend who uh, grew up here and is buried here named Peter Silken, who I worked with when I lived in Africa. And he once said to me, talk to people where they are, not where you think they should be. Um, it's very wise advice. It sounds like something your grandmother might say or you'd read on a greeting card. It's very, very difficult. But I think the, the last ingredient I would put in uh, to the heart and soul of a humanitarian activist movement is that we know a lot of people are turning away from this because of fear. They're fearful about the future. They're fearful of the other. We have prominent political figures around the world, no names, who are legitimizing the definition of the other, uh, who are cultivating hatred, and who are feeding off a fear that comes from the kind of rapid change we're seeing around the world. I can question those who foster that kind of thinking, but I can't question the person who feels afraid right now. So we've got to acknowledge that fear. And then I think we've got to find a way to talk to people who don't have the benefit of some of the experiences all of us have had, to have either studied this, worked in a crisis, work at ODI, work at the one campaign, serve in government, that don't have that experience, is to get to them and slowly, slowly, painstakingly listen to them and try to persuade them. And again, it takes a long time, but I've been at this for a long time, and it actually works. One of the single best examples I've seen recently, Kentucky is a part of the United States not known for being wildly democratic or <laughs> strongly in favor of big expenditures of foreign aid. Uh, and one of the best stories we have been able to use in the one campaign to defend uh, and fight against 30% proposed cuts in the budget is a family from some of the poorest parts of Kentucky who simply believe that it is the right thing to do to help your community and that the borders of their community do not end with the sidewalk. It just took having the conversations, reaching out and being patient enough to hear the other side. So, so in summary, the world's a mess. Um, I will always be an optimist, but I will also say in all the years I have been working on these issues, I have never seen a time that worries me more. A scale and scope of crisis that has sharper edges or a greater urgency for us to not admire the problem but to do something about it. And so my appeal comes on on top of profound thanks and respects for, respect for an international humanitarian community that I think is beloved, uh, but under thanked for the men and women and organizations that are out there in extreme danger doing the best they can to save people who got the shortest end of the stick. But my appeal at the same time is that we got to come together and do something about it. I was in a uh, <clears throat> circumstances once in the Situation Room where a colleague of mine said to the then National Security Advisor out of some anger uh, about an issue she really cared about, and we had just been having a discussion about it. She said, yes, but I deserve to be in the meeting. And he said, this is the meeting. You're like, this is the meeting. There is no other meeting somewhere else which is happening where groups of people are saying, how are we going to take this on? There's nobody else that's going to do it. I'm unbelievably confident in the ability of this community to come together, the academics among us, the operators among us, the policymakers among us. 
I believe that the world will support it because in all of these polls about how dire the world is, you know who comes out as trusted, highly regarded and respected? Humanitarian aid workers. Every time. So my appeal would be that we come together, we form the activist movement we need, we stand up for the people we serve, and frankly, we fight back. Because I think we can win, but I think if we don't, we risk losing. I will close by saying, again, I think it's dire, but if there's any community that can come together and that has shown that it's got the skill and the ability to do it, it's this one broadly, and hello all of you uh, out there. So all of us are putting our trust, confidence, and faith in all of you, and we'll stand with you absolutely. But I really think we need to do it now. With that, I will end. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. Thank you very much for that. Thank you for the manifesto that you've put in front of us and the optimism that it's you've a little shown. Orange, it's got the little orange book. <laughs> <laughs> Should be, yeah. Um, because I think we are an optimistic community by nature, right. and I do think that you're right, we have that kind of passion and compassion to make it happen. But you know, you've got a room here full of practitioners, full of policymakers, full of thinkers that think about these issues every day. And although you've given us some pointers as to how we might you know, get out of our echo chamber and engage on some of these issues with people that don't quite yeah. understand what we're talking about, I wanted to ask you sort of more about the current administration. I think a lot of us working in this space are really at, at uh, you know, completely don't know what to do about how to engage with uh, someone or, 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 or a politic that is completely disengaged. And I know from you know, previous Republican administrations, for example, um, they came into office not really believing in the multilateral system, being very skeptical of aid and, and the effectiveness of aid. But during the course of their tenure and working with organizations such as the, as the United Nations or with governments on humanitarian issues, really came to understand that promoting America's values from within was actually quite effective. Um, mm -hmm. And so they, then they did engage. But it seems that this form of America First has preferred to disengage completely. How do we, as the humanitarian community, how do we engage with that kind of disengagement? Mm, yeah. Um, I think there are a couple things. I, and, I, and I think you've got to distinguish in the United States, yes, there is an administration and a fair number of people who support it who believe that America First does mean leaning in the direction of building walls around borders, withdrawing, prioritizing the U.S., and not engaging in the kind of multilateralism, which has been a hallmark of U.S. foreign policy across political parties forever. Um, there are other parts of our government. And one of those is the Congress. And trust me, I watch Congress in their days, I think, oh, heavens, the virus is spreading. It's everywhere. Uh, but the fact of the matter is the, the biggest, most powerful bulwark against an anti-multilateralism has been from the Hill, including Republicans, who get that it is in our interest to engage, who may think the UN is weak and in need of reform, but who understand that the world is a much better place with it than without it. And the Congress is extremely powerful. The President of the United States appointed me as Administrator of USAID. I could not start my job until Ted Cruz took the hold off, right? So Congress is powerful. Um, and I, so I think that's one place. The other thing is I would take a page from what's happened on the climate change front, which I find fascinating. And it's not one which says government is withdrawing, so the private sector and NGOs are just going to have to fill the space. I worry about that, because that sort of government can abdicate its responsibility. What we've seen in that case is that private sector leaders, faith leaders, governors, mayors, and citizens have come together and said, the US government may have withdrawn from Paris, but America didn't. And they've organized themselves, and they are remaining engaged. And I, I think I'm, I'm not sure it will be sufficient. But it's something that gives me some hope. Um, I think lastly, on the 
specific issue of humanitarianism and humanitarian assistance, um, the faith community is massively important. Now, even there in the United States, if you go back to the early days of PEPFAR, where we had a huge coalition of faith leaders, every faith you could imagine, and from right to left and everything. There are even rifts in that community today that reflect some of the partisanship we're seeing. But across that community, the commitment to core humanitarian values, humanitarian assistance, remember, I mean, the American people contribute billions of dollars every year to humanitarian appeals. And the bulk of that still comes through faith-based organizations. So I think part of it is finding other, other points of engagement. Um, but it's avoiding paralysis, and that's what I worry about. It's all so stark. It's like, oh, my God, I just have to go eat ice cream and think about this later. I, I don't, <laughs> I've done that a fair amount, but... Um, I'd love to take questions from all of you. Gail has put out sort of a, you know, a manifesto, as I was saying, in front of us. Um, what do you all think of this idea of a humanitarian movement? Um, do we have it in us to start one of those things? Um, what are some challenges there? Or other questions that you might have, please. Um, I'll start here in London, and then I'll take some questions from our online audience as well. <laughs> 